In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Earlier in this, in the Orthros this morning, one of my favorite hymns in the entire liturgical year occurred. And uh, it, it signifies the beginning of the Triodion. And the Triodion, just for, and we won't dive in too deep, but the Triodion is just a preparation period to kind of ease ourselves into Great Lent. It's a period of three or four weeks um, where we prepare. It's kind of like a warm up before you exercise. Um, anyway, the, the hymn that I'm kind of referring to is in Greek, it's called Dismetanias Anixon, which, mean, which means open to me the gates of repentance. And I'm going to read the rest of it. Open to me the gates of repentance, O giver of life. For early in the morning my spirit hastens to you, to your holy temple, bringing the temple of my body all defiled, but as one compassionate, cleanse me, I pray, by your loving kindness and mercy. Open to me the gates of repentance. It's this really beautiful image of the temple of God, the temple of our body, of our defiled temples, going into the kingdom of heaven. But we have to pass through repentance, and we have to pass through purification in order to enter in holy. And this this is in part due to this idea in the, in the Old Testament where they had death by holiness, where God would appear to people and they would be unclean and they would die. It says, God, God says, you cannot see me and live. And so there's this idea spiritually how in order to save our souls, in order to save who we are, we have to purify ourselves and to humble ourselves through these gates of repentance. And so it's a really beautiful image of kind of the beginning of this, this, you know, path to Pascha, this kind of this preparation period as we prepare for the resurrection of our Lord. And as you know, Lent is a time for rehabilitation and rejuvenation and renewal and all these re, 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 right? Well, you can't have any of those beautiful renewal or rejuvenation or any of these things, rehabilitation, without the most important re, which is repentance. Without repentance, you don't have renewal. Without repentance, you don't have rejuvenation. Without repentance, you can't celebrate the glory of the resurrection fully. And so today, that's why the church has this period where we are preparing, right? Today, we're confronted with this image of humility because you can't repent if you're not humble it's very simple and so we dive deep a little bit into what it means to be humble and so let's look at this pharisee and the publican and i'll give a little context and we'll kind of dive a little deeper as well so when you approach today's gospel you have to not approach it with a modern eye we have to remember that then the Pharisee was commonly known as the good guy. When we hear Pharisee, we kind of put the lens on of, oh, well, the Pharisees were the ones that crucified Christ, right? Those were the ones that put, the scribes and the Pharisees were the ones that crucified Christ. At the time, when the hearers of this gospel, they would be thinking, oh, the Pharisee, that's the good person. That's the one that follows the law. That's the one that prays. That's the one that tithes, right? That's the one that follows the outwardness of the law. And the publican was the opposite. The publican was known to be as an unrighteous, unjust, extortionist, liar, cheat, lustful for money, greedy, all of these things. They were known as people that were backstabbing, people that would, you know, look out for numero uno all the time, right? And so when we look at this, we have to look at it from an ancient perspective. You know, we, have, we would look at it like, instead of the publican and the Pharisee, you could make it look like the, the monk and the drug addict, right? The monk, we would say, oh, well, the monk is, is someone that is, you know, holy, and he's, you know, he's fasting, and he's tithing, and he's, you know, giving his whole life to God. And the drug addict, well, he's just a waste of space. 
you know, that he doesn't matter. He's, he's, he's a ruin anyway. That's kind of what it would be like, the publican and the Pharisee, to translate it into modern day times. So what happened? We see the Pharisee, the one that was supposed to be the good guy, clothed in broad robes and long tassels at the end of his garments. And he stood, which was the universal posture of prayer in antiquity. And it says that he was praying with himself. And St. Basil comments on this and he says, He prayed with himself, that is not with God. His sin of pride sent him back into himself. And then, how did he pray? He prayed and he listed off all of his virtues. Lord, I am just. Lord, I am so good at tithing. Lord, I fast twice a week. I'm so good. But I'm not an extortioner. And I'm not unjust. And I'm certainly not like that drug addict over there. Or that publican over there, that tax collector. I'm certainly not like him. His righteousness, he believed, was his own doing. He didn't need God for mercy. He didn't need God for forgiveness. Because he saw himself as perfect. All he needed was God to know that he was perfect. Contrast this to the publican, to the tax collector. He was completely self-aware of his sinfulness. Completely self-aware of his brokenness. Completely self-aware of his unworthiness. And he stood at a distance. He didn't even see himself fit to walk into the door. He was unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven. And it says that he struck his chest in anguish and self-abasement. And all he could say was, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm sorry, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Forgive me. It's a big, and that's actually a point in my, my talk. God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. And that's very on purpose. It's not a sinner. He realized himself as the sinner, as we are all called to do as well. And so Christ then comes to the surprising ending that, you know, that the Pharisees... Prayer was not heard, and the publican's prayer was heard, and then he was justified, and he was forgiven and, and blessed, rather than the Pharisee. So what happens? Why, why did this occur? There's a famous saying from the Desert Father that, that Desert Fathers, it kind of elaborates on this point. Why one, you know, why the, the tax collector went away blessed and the other didn't. And it says, better a man who has sinned if he knows that he has sinned and repents, then a man who has sinned and thinks himself as righteous. Better a man who has sinned if he knows that he has sinned and repents than a man who has sinned and thinks of himself as righteous. The Pharisee, by his pride, spent his whole life in exaltation of himself, confident in his own righteousness. Whereas the tax collector humbled himself and abased himself, knowing that his only hope was mercy. And so the Pharisee's life was built on a foundation of unreachable, exalted pride. And thus his prayer was unacceptable to God. I liken this, this meta, I have like a little image that I'd like to offer is you know, when we think of this, of this image of when we're talking about humility and prayer, ask yourself, when you go to the doctor, what do you do? What happens? You know, when I go to the doctor, I'm not listing off, well, doc, uh, you know, my, uh, my blood pressure is, I don't even know, a good number. You know, the good number, 120 over 80. I'm not a scientist. Um, you know, my, uh, my, you know, my BMI is low, you know, I have good cholesterol, I run two miles a day, that doesn't happen. Um, you know, 
we don't, that's not how this works. You don't go to the doctor's office and say, you know, doc, I'm all good, but never mind the bullet hole in my arm. I'm okay. I'm okay. But I can run two miles. That's nonsense, right? When we present ourselves to the physician of our souls and bodies, we don't tell him, Lord, I'm, you know, I'm good to others. I'm, uh, I'm a righteous man. I go to church every Sunday. I, 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 you know, I partake of communion. I, I try and do well to others. That's not how we pray. That's not humility. That's nonsensical is what it is. And it's prideful. We shouldn't be praying like that. We should be humbly asking for forgiveness. We should be humbly asking for mercy. We shouldn't be going with self-praise and virtue signaling. To know thyself is to know your sinfulness. And when you know your sinfulness, you know your only hope is in God. Remember your sinfulness. This will springboard you into humility, and that humility into repentance, and that repentance into renewal and rejuvenation. St. Basil says, Humility often saves a sinner who has committed many terrible transgressions. It's a simple formula, but it's one that we often forget. Go to Christ. Plead with him for mercy. And when you pray, pray like the tax collector and know your sinfulness and your brokenness. And if you do that, I guarantee you, you will have a much more fruitful and beautiful Lenten season. And you'll ex experience the resurrection in a fuller, more edifying way than you ever have. May we all pray and humble ourselves as the sinful tax collector. God bless you, and let us continue on with the liturgy.